Welcome everyone to one of the community sessions uh, and uh, which is the AI engineering community session. Uh, my hope is that everyone who's in this call can admit the people that are in the that want to join this meeting because I, our assistant just left and I am the one that sometimes is in the picture and sometimes operating the computer. So that's the job of the director of the software center as you can tell. I am really excited to announce a keynote by, oh, sorry, let me start with this. Where is AI going when, uh, from my perspective? You know, I make slides and then I forget what I actually put on them. So I believe, and this is my view, that we're moving in three major transformations. The first is we're moving from centralized learning to decentralized learning, which then brings us to topics like federated learning in place. And this is important for me, for my view in the software center, because we have so many distributed uh, companies that have lots of devices out in the field. So we really want to make use of all those devices and the learnings of those devices in order to make sure that we can uh, optimally make use of that. The second is, traditionally AI was a lot about offline training. How do I train in a separate location, is centralized data, et cetera, et cetera, to online training. So how do I build systems that fully autonomously by themselves get better every day I use them? And as you probably saw in the plenary session, I'm very concerned with uh, systems that get better every day that you use them. Syst we really want to see continuous improvement. And then finally, what we believe is happening is that AI is very much going from its own thing to being very much more integrated into a data fabric where we have data pipelines, we have nested feedback loops and other kinds of things. And then we were thinking about who could give a very interesting keynote around exactly these kind of questions. And the good news is that we have uh, one of the member companies called Grundfos who has uh, a head of AI solutions in digital development by the name of Nette Lexmant, I suppose. Is yes. And she decided that she didn't want to do this by herself, but that she wanted to bring a few of her colleagues along, um, who I'm sure Meta will introduce by herself, because to be very honest, guys, I forgot your names yeah, again. So <laughs> sorry about that. that. But with that, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor to Mette, and hopefully she will introduce her colleagues and uh, give us an introduction. At the end, similar to the previous one, uh, the plenary session, we will allow for questions and engage in a little bit of a discussion. So with that, please, Mette, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can I, I will just use this one, yeah. Uh, so, uh, very pleased to be here and, uh, and uh, to speak to you, even though I can't see you. Um, but uh, I brought uh, with me two, two of the people from my department. Um, it is Reza, who is a lead data scientist, and it is Rasmus, who is also a lead data scientist. And, uh, and we, they are currently working in the area of, of, uh, of what we're going to discuss now. And they are the real heroes, so that's why, uh, in some way, I think it's more it's more fun for you guys to actually hear something from, from the horse's mouth instead of uh, me saying everything. So I will say a bit in the beginning about uh, some more general things and then we will move into something about our development processes and then at, at the end we will talk about uh, MLOps. So uh, let's get started. <coughs> I'll just uh, flip the slides. So this is our, uh, our department. We are a p department under what we call digital development. And it's a newly formed uh, part of Grundfos that is formed out of a need for uh, moving away from being a commodity, but actually to move into uh, to the service uh, sales, you can say, selling digital services to customers directly. Um, and, and this was formed, uh, started, depending on where you measure it, it's four to two years ago. Um, that we started on this journey. Um, and uh, in, in the department, there's uh, data engineers, controls engineers, and, and data scientists working in this area. I will, uh, I will say uh, thank you for the very nice introduction, Jan, but uh, we are not quite there yet. We are not at federated learning. We are not at reinforcement learning. We are starting a journey. Um, and that's really where we are. So I'm going to tell you about our journey. I'm going to share some of the problems we faced and some of the learnings we had. And then I'm going to also show you some, uh, some dirty laundry um, to, to, uh, to show that, that this is actually uh, not without problems in an old industrial company 
to start making digital products uh, and, uh, and getting awareness of data and AI. So I would want to start by telling you a bit about what we are developing and, and, uh, and how we're doing this. So uh, I will just show you some examples of the digital offerings that we're currently developing so you can get a feeling of what is it we're talking about. Uh, we have something called Grundfos Building Connect, which is a service for, uh, for janitors of uh, big buildings. It could be a hotel, it could be a big apartment um, building um, that can provide intelligent alarms, uh, application control and optimization and, and insights and, rec and recommendations. So you'll see some, sc some screenshots from the, and, and there's also some hardware involved and so on. But that's one of the solutions we have. Um, another one is uh, Grundfos Utility Connect, which is a monitoring solution for uh, mainly uh, water applications. So that we can say it's more of a SCADA light solution uh, as it is now. The intention is then to put something on top of that. Um, but, but right now it's, it's, it's really a, a monitoring solution. Um, you can see some screenshots there. We don't need to go into detail, but I just want to show you these uh, few examples. The last one is, uh, is Wastewater Network Connect. So it's, uh, or it's called Grundfos Eye Solutions for Wastewater Network. Um, and that is a solution for, uh, for wastewater networks, as it says. Um, that is uh, also what Reza is going to show you an example of in the end of this talk. So that one has uh, some offerings uh, that that the customer can use and uh, and uh, we will tell you a bit more about that later one of the things uh, with Grundfos is that we have already developed a lot of traditional algorithms uh, that is actually coming in many times as um, somehow a, a, a blocker for actually moving forward in the ai area as i see it we have uh, we have a way of developing and that uh, sort of has uh, put its mark on the entire uh, on the entire organization. You could say that this is the way we develop algorithms. So if you talk about algorithms, people will have this in mind. So what we do here is uh, using Simulink, Dimula, and uh, and MATLAB together with a controls engineer to do a static uh, algorithm development. We test that on lab data. Then that algorithm is is uh, put through a con code conversion uh, group that tests that up against lab data, and then it's put into uh, the devices. And then we're selling the devices in a box. We're never seeing that again, unless somebody calls us and says, your damn algorithm isn't working. So this is the way we've done things uh, so far. Um, and that still, of course, has a, a very, uh, we still have a use for that because there's many products that will never be digital uh, in our areas. We have many different types of products. But we really want to move towards a more, it looks very, very complex, and I'm sorry I can't point because <laughs> I would have liked to do that. But um, we have some sensors, all kinds of sensors, uh, SCADA systems and edge devices that can deliver data to a data foundation. This is what we are moving towards. Um, then the experimentation on the left side uh, can be done uh, on that data foundation. Uh, and then uh, we can use uh, CICD deployment to actually get it into production and show it in a front end or deploy a model to an edge device. So it's it, that is our new way uh, of working. Um, and, and the difficult part, uh, is not so much the, techno the technical things uh, as I see it. It's really about getting awareness in the company about uh, that this is needed. We need data foundation. We need to work with experimentation. We need to work with customers getting early feedback. We need to uh, work on the uh, CICD uh, pipeline and so on. So there's many new things for Grundfos and, uh, and that is actually why I think we're not moving as fast as uh, the three of us and the rest of the department were actually like. Um, you can say the way we started out by developing uh, digital offerings is, is uh, according to a, what I would call a software architecture. So uh, there were some uh, backend services that delivered uh, an account service, a data transport layer, and external data that was delivered on event hubs. Um, and this is actually what it looks like in most of our offerings still. Um, then 
that is transferred to some uh, database. In most cases, Postgres uh, data transformations takes place on that uh, database in a backend done in C Sharp by uh, backend developers. Um, and then uh, the front end is, uh, is utilizing that data. So, so that is the way it's been uh, thought out uh, when we started. Um, and, uh, and we're really trying to also move away from that uh, because it creates a lot of problems for us, uh, for example. And uh, as you could expect, very expensive uh, database for raw data storage because this is the only place we store the raw data in many of our offerings. Um, that is a big problem. Another problem is that we don't have proper data pipelines um, in, in those offerings where we have this uh, running now. And we don't have proper data quality assessment. So this is really our dirty laundry as I see it. So uh, what we're moving towards is this one. Um, and uh, we're still using, of course, the same, uh, same backend services for providing the data. But now we put in a data platform. Uh, it's in the making, so it's not we're not there yet, but we are uh, on the way with developing this. Uh, where we do things in a, in a proper way, we use the right tools, we use Snowflake, we use uh, dbt for, uh, for actually transforming the data and storing the data. Another thing we're working on is the AI platform. Uh, we call it platform, but in, in fact, it's, uh, it's a reference architecture for how we want to run AI. Uh, we've, we have implemented it, uh, I think we can say we've implement implemented it in one case, in production, and then we have some POCs on the way. So that's really where we are uh, in terms of, of, uh, of getting this deployed. We of course still need the backend to serve the data to the, to the front end, if there's a front end, but, uh, but that would be a much smaller task and the database would, uh, would, would only contain the data that the, that the front end actually needs. So this is from a playbook that Rasmus will uh, be talking about later. Um, so data pipelines is super important for us. Uh, that concept has been really difficult to get, uh, get understanding of in, in the company as such. Having lineage of data, orchestrating the different activities and controlling the data flow, and having the ability to rerun data when you find a bug, and you will find a bug. So, so this is really what we uh, we have strived to implement, but in, in uh, many cases, we are not there yet. Um, but in the, in the data foundation that we are, or the data platform that we're currently building, uh, the idea is uh, that we are we're having a separation between raw data, standardized data, and curated data, and have proper data pipelines in between that can be monitored, that can be, uh, be under uh, uh, code uh, uh, versioning, and so on. Good. I think that's uh, my first uh, few things. I think we had actually planned to do some questions in between, but we will just skip that and go for questions at the end. Is that uh, good? All right. Then uh, the floor is yours, Rasmus. Cool. Can you hear me? Is that clear? Yeah, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the development process that we're looking into here in, in, in our group. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about I'm going to talk about three three steps we have taken. So uh, we are probably not at the end, but uh, I'm going to talk about some steps we have taken and what was good and what was not so good. Three steps, but before we do that, I would just like to say sort of a little bit about wh why we are doing this. So um, we uh, are, of course, uh, as Meta said, we are 12 people, but there are, of course, other data scientists and data engineers and business analysts and XR people in Grundfos. Uh, I have only been here for three years, uh, and I would say it is still in the AI uh, is still a little bit wild west in Grundfos, um, and we would like that to be a little bit more towards some some law and order, not not to handcuff people, but just to have some some guidelines. So so that is one thing. Uh, the other thing is that that as we see it, AI is is typically in Grundfos because Confos is an old company, is retrofitted into existing solutions. So we have something, can't you just put some AI on top of that, and then it's great. Um, that also means that we come, to come in quite late in the process, and we would like to come in earlier so we can sort of shape the data foundation, for instance. Um, and, um, and, and for to be able to do that, having some so sort of development process or some sort of way to do stuff described, 
uh, would be beneficial. Uh, and finally, it's it's about onboarding. Like we get a lot of new people in, and people are leaving, and people are coming in, and of course we're also growing. So having somewhere to point to to newcomers. Also, because it's a very inhomogeneous uh, bunch, we are some from academia, some have a lot of experience from industry. Somewhere where we can point and say, th this is actually sort of what we believe in in, in Grundfos. So that's just sort of the why. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about the, the sort of the first step. So, so the first step that we did, and that was actually from from the previous managers, not Mette, but uh, her predecessor in, 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 in and and uh, another manager. They came up with this uh, with this airplane initiative i think they did it uh, this airplane model I, they did it with another guy and i, I forgot his name so i'm just looking at my notes if i put it here I can find it when somewhere henrik gerstberg maybe some of you know him um but um, they came up with this uh, great idea that that it's not just something you do and then you're done with it it actually has some phases and we have something that is sort of kind of fussy an idea and we we, we look into that one and, and and develop that one into something where we can test uh, different features and get clarity of what this is actually about and then we go into the beta phase where we reach a lean technical production we go into ramp up we are putting more and more devices on and then at the end we have the full scale production line where where things are just operational and this has been, I mean, in, in my opinion, this has been a great thing in many ways because it was a great conversation starter. Like, it, it was it was a good talking point explaining non-AI people that it's, it's not just do, do and forget, but, but it's actually something that, that takes time to develop. Um, yeah, and at, it's a, it's a also conveys the idea that it takes time to develop stuff like this. Um, and it all, yeah, and, and the phases here. Uh, it's not as good as an operating tool for, for data scientists, for instance. Okay, what, what constitutes an alpha phase? When are you in an alpha phase? What are you actually going to do? It's, it's these few words are, are maybe not sufficient for what, for what we want to do. So, so it has clearly lags, and you can also hear that it comes from, from, from management. This is easy for them to understand. This is just how we do it. So, so uh, we actually agreed that we would we would quite uh, we would would like to do something more, and, and uh, that leads us to the next step, uh, which was uh, r making of playbooks. Um, so the idea here was that we would make two playbooks and introduce uh, two um, two two sort of assets. One called analytical assets, which are al the algorithm, AI, and machine learning stuff, and one called data pipelines, um, and and try to in each of those two books i have i have brought them here so you can just see that they're actually actually made on, on nice paper oh sorry whoops uh, nice paper and, and you can take them and look at them and you can give them to people they get very excited when they get them in their hands so i i encourage you to come and see us and look at the the, the playbooks today um but that was of course not not the main part of it uh, the main part was that we get, got a, a conveyor of, of we could talk to other people and say how we we um, how we saw the world as as as, as a uh, data scientist and data engineers um so i i'm primarily going to talk about the analytical asset playbook because that was the one i was i was involved in writing um and i'm just gonna give you a very brief sneak peek so there is there's a lot of of, of ideas uh, it's, it's rather brief but but um, we we talk we, we introduce some of, of the the concepts like uh, benchmarking and monitoring and of course this analytical asset and also about the different interfaces so talking to business talking to to uh, domain experts and and um, what we see our role is in, in in that matrix and and the idea of reproducibility is also very important for us and then we did something else we started making this checklist of responsibilities so what actually constitutes uh, an alpha phase what should you do in the alpha phase and then we had we had sort of five um, five different uh, dimensions that we looked at um, so the feedback from this was was of course mixed quite most of it was good people liked looking at it people uh, and and it, i think there was two groups we had sort of the the non ai people they loved it uh, without any question they they lo loved the idea that they could get into see what goes on behind the curtain on the other hand, the, the, the data scientists, the data engineers, maybe not as much, um, and and there is some some guidance here, but 
what we got from it was this is not enough we, we need to talk more about it and, and another thing was also that the buy-in maybe so this was written by a, a little bunch of, of, uh, of our data scientists so maybe the buy-in was not complete what it should be so 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 the next step we took and the third step and where we are now was that we we made what we call dp for ai checklist so we heard that we needed more rails more guiding uh, and and so so we we explored a lot th this checklist we really unfolded it and we found a lot of other things we needed to look at and were more specific on what should you do when uh, down to to quite minute layer um, um, yes so so this this is sort of a more or less a framework it's it's not a process it's a checklist and and we we sort of agreeing that we have a lot of ideas written down here if you don't want to do it that's fine but please state why you you think that doesn't apply to you uh, and and maybe the most important stuff here is that it's a group effort so we have made it in our group uh, we have made this and we have made it in such a way that we had experts either internal from our group or external coming in and talking about a, st a topic that could be uh, git repositories um, then we had a, a, a talk on, on what are the, what different kinds of git repositories actually do exist uh, and then uh, the week after we sort of had a big sort of brainstorming session where everybody could write up what they think where, where should you do what and then we had a discussion and then we formalized it um, into into our devops uh, oh yeah, I'm just going to skip this one. Then we formalized it into our our DevOps, <coughs> well, our Azure DevOps. We actually made a wiki in there where we had sort of the checklist. And 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 the good thing about this one is that you can actually uh, you can clone it, so you can put it into your own repository, clone the, the template, and then you have the entire checklist. I'm sorry, I cannot show it here because I don't have uh, access behind our firewall here, but. These are these are the dimensions that we put in. So we are talking about governance issues, requirements, development, code quality, documentation, data foundation, and MLOps. And I think we have actually added two additional points called uh, security and patents. So when should you think about a patent for for a different uh, a feature you are developing? Um, um, yes, I think that is m that is more or less where we are right now. Um, let me just see. Yes, this is where we are right now, and I think uh, the learning has also been that that this involving people, getting people to m write their own rules, uh, makes it much easier to agree on. So I, I, I have just put this Conrad Lawrence quote here. I don't know if he actually made it. Nobody does, but 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 um, th this about okay. We heard the manager say we need some we need a guiding tool. We are hearing it. We are not understanding it. And now we are uh, we are doing it ourselves. So I think we are trying to understand that this is actually important, and we are also almost agreeing. So we now we just need the final step of on applying it, and then what we have uh, when we applied it, maintaining it. Uh, and and as I said, we 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 are testing it now and seeing how this works on on our proof of concept projects. And I guess this is probably not the last thing we are going to do, but um, this is where we are now. Yes. So now I'm going to give it to Reza. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yes. Great, thank you. And basically, I would talk about uh, MLOps today. First, I give a short. Oh, sorry. Yes. Mm. Oh, it should be much better. Yeah, today I'm uh, going to talk about the MLOps. First, I would give actually a short introduction about our approach for doing MLOps at HomeForce. And afterward, basically, I would give an example about an analytics projects in the digital development uh, department at at Confos that how actually we implement the MLOps and, and, and we do the analytics solution there. Yes, at Confos, uh, as Meta said, we are a team of data scientists, data engineers, control engineers, but I am mainly actually in the part related to the data scientists and in the data scientists community usually we use R and Python as the main programming language. Then when we develop a machine learning model, always it's the question that, okay, now I have my model, then just how we can, uh, how we can basically operationalize our ML model. And here I think that the concepts of the MLOps can help just, can, can help us basically just go toward that actually cloud integration with, uh, to cloud integration to operationalize our machine learning models. But basically at Confos we are using the Microsoft Azure as the main actually cloud venue. Then we have chosen a Microsoft 
Azure Machine Learning Service as the main AI platforms in the digital development uh, digital development department. And as I said, we follow the MLOF that is basically a good combination of the machine learning, dev, and ops. We also follow some kind of uh, reference architecture for the MLOPs, and we usually follow the guidelines from Microsoft and Google Cloud. We are also in the process of making maybe a, a standard a guideline, a Confos standard guideline for doing the MLOPs for the Confos actually analytics analytics projects. But basically, when we do the machine learning project, usually we need to follow these steps from data extraction, data analysis, do the initial ABA data preparation, model training, model evaluation, model validation, model serving, and model monitoring. Then uh, from the MLOps point of view, when we want just to operationalize actually these steps and do the actually the cloud integrations, we might see that basically a different maturity levels from level zero to level one. In level zero, let's say maybe we do everything manual, maybe we trained actually the model manually and just manually we put it maybe in the registry and then the backend team actually they can actually consume the model and make some kind of API service from the model. But if we go to level one, we can have more automation. For example, we can automate the training part, automation of the of the model model training. But in that level two that we would like actually to be at that level, we need to have the, the complete automations for the, for the machine learning models uh, using the continuous integration continuous development and continuous training of the of the machine learning models. And at Confos basically we are trying just to push ourselves from that level zero to level two. <laughs> but how the level two actually looks like in a very maybe simple actually workflow, we would like just to go from the source code to the uh, production service and do the monitoring in a continuous improvement actually approach. Uh, we come basically with some kind of uh, development uh, for doing the experimentations, and then just we have the source code, and from the source code we can go to the package by by having some kind of uh, CI pipeline, and then from the package we want just to provide some kind of automated pipeline in order just to do the automated model training, and the result of that automated model training could be actually the, the train model that can go to the model registry. When we have actually that automated pipeline, we need also to have some kind of continuous training just to train the model based on a schedule or based on some kind of uh, batch mode uh, uh, service or microservice actually APIs. And then when we have actually the trained model, then just we want just to consume the model, provide the prediction of the model, and when we have the prediction, of course we need to have some kind of feedbacks from the monitoring, whether we need to retrain it, again, by using that continuous training, or whether we need just to go back and modify off codes in order just to solve maybe some of the issues and bugs. But there are much more details in this process, and uh, I have some of backup, back, yeah, slides in the backup, and if we need just to discuss more, actually, then just after in the discussion session, we can, we can do it. Uh, about the analytics project, this is one of the basically analytics solution that uh, we have uh, we have at Confos. Uh, it's called Base Father Network Connect. Basically, it is an application for monitoring and op on optimization of the SOAR networks. We provide five offerings from uh, monitoring the SOAR or waste in the in the in the SOAR networks from actual flow inf infiltration, flow predictive maintenance, capacity utilization, and overflow warnings. Mainly our data is coming from our pumping stations. In the left side, you see a pumping station with two pipes, with one inlet pipe and two outlet pipes. We get the telemetry data that contains the pump power consumption, peat water level, and pipes outlet pressure. Uh, we get the data in the second resolution, and usually we get the data in every, I think, 10 minutes or 15 minutes in the cloud using our IoT services. When we have actually the telemetry data, then just we have in the first step, we have some kind of uh, uh, adaptive pump model estimation that is similar to the machine learning models. We have a pump model that we train it for every eight hours, and then just we uh, inference that model for, let's say, every one hour or every two hours based on the request of the, of the application. The output of, of that actually pump model estimation would be estimated outflow and inflow in, in, the, in the pumping decisions then just we use them in order just to do to, to do the other offerings, for example, predictive maintenance, capacity utilization, and, and so on. So, but it is not only analytics. There are lots of other actually infrastructure components that is around analy analytics. And as I see here, analytics maybe in this project is not that much complicated, but the 
maybe the more complexity is coming actually around actually those uh, infrastructure components that I'm going just to explain a bit more about that. For the cloud compute service, basically we use the Azure ML service that is based on some kind of virtual machine that we that can be actually scaled up and down. Of data store service, they are based on the Postgres database and Azure Blob storage. We have a data provider service in order to provide the data for the analytics in the format that we require. We have a triggering and a scheduling service that is a Kubernetes-based service in order just to run the calculations or the machine learning models actually in a base, based on a specific schedule in the system. We have monitoring service in order to monitor the performance of the, of the calculation outputs using Python and, and Dash. And then also we have the telemetry service in order to get the data from the IoT devices and send it to the cloud. And in addition to that also we have asset service for the network configurations and, and, and so on. Uh, how the data flow looks like? As I said, basically we get the data in the second resolution for every in the batch of ten minutes. Then from our actually IoT devices, the data goes to the to the cloud using the telemetry service. And in the cloud, we have different components from the raw data service, asset service, network service, in order just to store the data and also store the uh, accounts and the network configurations but in the middle basically we have some kind of calculation engines that contains mainly the the, the two components Azure machine learning service and an orchestrator in order just to trigger the calculations based on the frequency that we need them and in the next slide I'm going to talk more uh, about this Azure machine learning service and also orchestrator service uh, of Analytical solution architecture basically looks like this. In the right side, we have the AML. The AML basically is an AI platform provided by Microsoft. In that platform, we can actually develop the analytics solution, and then just we can also choose the required compute target that we want just to, to run those analytics solutions there. We are the main, the data science basically, the, they are the main responsible for that AML part. But in the left side, you see the mainly the orchestrator around the solutions. We have a Kubernetes-based orchestrator that is running every 10 minutes. And then based on the, and then just we have connection between these two, uh, an API post. And based on the type of the calculation and name of the calculations, the orchestrator knows that what type of data should be retrieved from the database. And those uh, services that you see, for example, the data provider service or calculation proxy, they provide the data with the required format that we need in the calculations. Then we, the data then just would be fitted into the, into the calculations. And then just the output again goes to a blob storage and from blob storage would go to the raw, raw database. Uh, in the next slide, I would talk more about the Azure machine learning service and also the data science workflow when we are developing an algorithm with the, with the continuous improvement basically mindset. So first, we, if we have actually new features from the business that we want just to, to develop it, or if we see maybe a bug in the system, or if we want just to improve it, basically we have our source codes in R or Python. We do the required code changes. Then for sure actually we have some kind of version control, uh, and we have a CI CD platforms, Azure DevOps. We follow some kind of specific branching policy. Uh, in this project, we are following the Git flow branching policy, meaning that we have a master branch, then just we have a feature per feature branch, release, br release branch, and also the hotfix branch, and, and so on. So when we do that, all the code change, and then just mm, do the, the required version control on the, on the change that we need to have, then we have continuous integration pipelines. In the continuous integration pipeline, we do the automated unit test when we want just to merge from the feature branch to the master branch, and also in this step, we build uh, the package actually binary files or executable actually codes from the from our package, and in order to do this, we use the Docker technology. Technology everything is based on the containers. Then we put actually that Docker image to a, uh, a short Docker registry, and when we put that Docker image into the Azure Docker registry, then just we are done with the data science development part. So meaning that we have our core codes; they are in the in the Docker registry, and now we are ready actually just to deploy it to the to the cloud. And here we have tried actually just to be quite flexible whether we want to whether we want to deploy it to the Azure cloud or we want just to deploy it to the customer cloud. So using that Docker image and using the API services, we are able able to do this. But if we want to deploy it to the Azure cloud using the Azure machine learning service, these are the steps that we follow. Again, we would have another CI pipeline in order just to add the 
machine learning uh, SDK, Python SDK dependencies to that Docker image. We do also one important step here. It is the Docker security checks using the Black Dock service. Black Dock basically is a, the software for checking the vulnerabilities and the license issues of the packages that we use basically in the core code. And this is step is quite important for us and all the time we put it in the build pipeline to be sure that we are in the safe track when we are actually developing our core codes. When we are done, then basically again we push actually the, the final Docker image in another Docker registry. Now we are ready just to do the staging. The staging to the dev environment, to the, to the test environment, to the queue environment, or to the production environment. And for each environment, we follow these steps. First, we copy that Docker image, we publish an Azure machine learning pipeline, then just we test the published machine learning pipeline. And when we see that that pipeline actually is working okay with the test data and everything is fine, then just we create a REST API endpoints from that pipeline. And then the and then in the backend, they know that using that there's a there's this using this REST API endpoint, they can trigger the calculation and get the outputs. But for each Again, environment, we have a different uh, uh, resources. We have the container registry, we have the key vaults for storing the, the secrets, and we have the compute target that is basically the managed uh, extra machine learning uh, virtual machines. Uh, some of the best practices that we, we, we have here, uh, basically we have learned that it's a good idea just to separate the, the dev part and the ops part. And as basically as I see it, at least, when you combine it, then just you add more complexity. But if you try actually to, the, to separate the development parts from the operations part, then you have basically more control on the, on the way that you, you want just to deploy it to the cloud. For sure, we have learned that we need to do, this, do the security checks and basically based on the type of the application, we know that, for example, what type of licenses we are allowed to use. And also we have actually a very good overview that what are the possible vulnerabilities that may actually may coming from the from some of the some of the open source libraries. Especially when we are using with Docker, it means that the Linux space and in the Linux we should be careful about those vulnerabilities that, that, that may happen. We have found that data contrast is quite important just to have it uh, with, the, with the data engineers, just to have a very actually consistent way of communication with each other that for each calculation or for each algorithm, what is the required data, in what format, what is the schema of that JSON, JSON file that we need, that is quite important. We follow a specific branching policy and it's a good idea just to have it. As I said, we follow the Git fellow branching policy and also we think that also it's important that when you are, we are developing, developing such, a, uh, such an application, we should think about the scalability. So we should not actually develop something that cannot be scaled up and down. And basically by using the extra machine learning service, we are able just to scale it up and down based on the number of virtual machines that we want to use it. Of course, we use also, we follow the stand, uh, standard best practices for the software development. For example, we, we do a lot of code reviews, pull requests and other things and also package management to be sure actually just off codes are, are, are repurity repu results. Yes, that was all, but I would like to end my presentation by this actually famous uh, sentence by uh, George Box, that was this famous uh, statistician in uh, uh, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And basically I believe on this because we cannot just close our eyes, just put something on the production and think, okay, it would work. No, it wouldn't work. We need just to have that mindset that if we develop something and then if even actually we put it into production, that how we can have that continuous improvement. Because the box usually is not coming from the simulated data, the box coming from reality. Mm -hmm. And modeling the re reality is quite complicated. And especially I think in our application that we are working with sensors because everything can happen with the sensor due to the quality issues and other things. And we should have actually this in mindset let's develop the infrastructure, let's develop the code in a way to be able just to modify it pretty fast. Otherwise it would be slow and I don't think that we would, we would be in a good, good track. Yeah, that's all from my side. Excellent. And that sort of ends our presentation. So uh, I don't know if there's any, ah, oh, there's some questions. Yeah. We have one, I have one here. So, um, I'll take uh, this yeah. one. The questions there are from the previous uh, keynote. Ah, okay. So uh, thank you. Let me start by thanking mm -hmm. all of you for a wonderful presentation, which 
did not only include all the highs, but also some dirty laundry, yeah. as you were talking about, <laughs> which I think is just really fair because all of the software center companies, uh, if we were perfect, if any of us were perfect, I mean, life would be very different, right? Yeah. So uh, what I would like to do is to invite the audience to either uh, unmute and ask questions where, um, or to type questions in the chat as we have those on the screen. And as the questions are coming in, um, let me start by asking, what is the, m the AI solution that you deployed that you're actually most proud of? Since we only have, uh, if, uh, if I should say it, since we only have one in production. Right, uh, which is the one that we talked which about. Which uh, is the one we talked about, one? Yeah. yeah. We have several things on the way, mm -hmm. but the only thing that is actually uh, with paying customers is, uh, is, is this uh, that Reza talked about. So in right. some, in the operational way, I think that's the one we should be proud of. Yeah, uh, it's not maybe the most advanced. Um, you can say uh, it's advanced, but maybe it's not a. It's not utilizing the full potential of being data driven because yeah. it's it's based on uh, some physical assumptions and so on. So it's right. more of a parameter estimation. But uh, but I think for the operations parts, that's that's the one I'm most proud of. As I yeah. <laughs> right. No, that's that's really yeah. good. So now from Roger Westman, he's from Toyota Material yep. Handling. There's a question on the screen. Uh, have you experienced any data integrity issues, GPR related, etc.? And have you experienced any concerns from customers to share data? And if any of you want to respond to me, feel free to ask for the mic. Huh? So, yeah. but yeah. Meta, Meta is mic as it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think uh, we have a few uh, GDPR uh, related. Uh, Data issues. Um, so we have, we are dealing with uh, with data that can be uh, potentially uh, GDPR um, sort of uh, imposed. But but I think, uh, and I think we are not uh, very far in actually um, doing this about uh, about getting full access to to customers' data. So right. far, we have a very limited access to using the data. We have a few customers that are. Um, that has uh, said okay that we can use that data for anything and then the rest mm. are more like we have a data handle agreement with them right and yeah. meaning that you can use the data for a limited set of use cases for for that use case that we are uh, providing them a solution ah, for right. i think that's how uh, how it's stated yeah and you can only use the data from that customer for that customer uh, I think we can actually use it for developing, uh, but I think that's also a, an area where we where we are actually uh, for different uh, for different of our digital offerings mm -hmm. we have different uh, data handler agreements. So it's right. actually different for different offerings. So for some of them, there's more uh, it's more sort of expanded, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. for other it's more limited. Yeah. Right. Good. Uh, so as as I mentioned, please keep asking questions in the in the chat because I think that was the nicest way to be interactive. Oh, there is look at that. As you mentioned, you are collecting data every ten minutes. It should be wireless data. Do you have uh, hardware on the product to send data, or does the hardware belong to the customer? Yeah, and I think uh, yeah, you can answer it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or you decide <coughs> how you want to do it. Yeah, it's yeah, a free country. Country. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, about the devices, we in this project actually we have actually the commissioning process. We send the devices uh, to the customers, and then just using uh, those IoT devices, we gather the data from the from the customer side. And some of them actually also coming from of actually PLC because if we have the open pumps, then just we have access to to the to the pump data. But usually we install the level sensors and the pressure sensors, and then just we have actually the communication devices in between, and then just we can gather the data in the cloud for every, mm. every mm. 10 minutes. This is one way of gathering the data, but also we have the another actually way of uh, getting the customer data is by connecting to the customer actually cloud cloud system, for example, connecting to their SCADA system. Right. And then just we can gather the data from actually their data center actually. So then this it's, it's mm. coming through the mm. FTP servers or it's coming directly from their, their cloud. So yeah. we have two ways. Yeah. So you can say we have uh, either customer data that is coming in some way from a SCADA system yes. or whatever, then we have our pump delivering data, and then we can have extra sensors that we put on right. uh, that is specific for that offering that we are trying to, uh, to, yeah. to yeah. deliver. Yeah. And about that communication devices belong to you, and if we actually install the communication devices offset, then, then those would us. belong to yeah. us. Yeah. 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 But then just we have also a contract with the customers. The GDPR, the security, and yeah. 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 So, 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 
that was I th really helpful because I think it's I think your categorization of either the pump has the sensor, yeah. we have an extra sensor, or we pull it out of the SCADA system of yeah. the, of the yeah. customer. Yeah. But it brings me to a next question. What, where do you run your AI algorithms? Yeah. And here is my, and this is a more of a strategic question I would love to have your take on. In general, my feeling is that the more you pull to the cloud, the more you are opening up yourself to competition from other players that have less domain knowledge. Yeah. And the more you can run things on device, the closer you are to your own devices, the more domain knowledge you typically need and the more things are integrated with your product. So I noticed in your presentations that everything felt quite centralized yeah. and in the cloud. But I was almost looking at how, how, do you, how does Grundfos look at that question and to what extent are you ready yeah. to push things towards devices to the edge yeah. and to what extent do you want to run things in the yeah. cloud? So I think that the, the reason that it looks very centralized is because we are representing that part that takes care of the cloud. Right. So, uh, so basically we have other departments that work with, with also with AI and, and putting things into the product right. uh, on a more sort of uh, long-term basis. Mm -hmm. as, as I don't remember from the presentation, but, but we have this uh, traditional way of developing AI uh, or developing algorithms that is still in use and also being developed as, uh, as we go along. We haven't touched on that at all. Mm -hmm. So here we are, we are mainly talking about uh, the space where we are providing an, a new digital service. And it's not uh, only cloud-based, um, but it's, it's doing things in different ways. So it's really complicated. We have to explain all the different ways that it's actually inter inter interacting with the customer. Because uh, the one I showed you before, Building Connect, uh, mm. is, is a service that actually mostly runs on the device. Um, right. Yeah. Um, but there we also have some things that needs to run in the cloud. Yes. Yep. I, I just want to elaborate that with we are also looking into it like on, on a PUC level. Yeah. Into into making machine learning on devices. Of course there are a lot of limitations. So so mm. some of the stuff we're looking into is how can we use it, utilize our skill set which is primarily on the cloud level, big models and stuff like that. How can we use that to make uh, models put them on, on the edge devices. So, so there's a lot of transformation limitations that you need to do. The, 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 frame, the platform you're going to end up, maybe there's no IO on that uh, iOS, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> maybe there's no uh, OS on, on that yes. one. Yeah. Uh, and, and another thing is how do we ensure that, that we want to, if we put an algorithm there, how do we validate that what it says is actually accurate? Because we don't have that access to the data maybe as, as we would have in the cloud. So right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so mayb maybe I should also add because one of and I th uh, there could we could go many ways. Uh, I think Grundfos is in a phase where we are trying to find our feet in the area of AI and digital. Mm. Um, and I think from my perspective, uh, we are also going to move from the cloud to edge, but that will be different from what we have been traditionally doing. Right. Um, so I think we we are in the process of meeting each other. Um, the embedded people and the uh, and the cloud people meeting each other on the edge we need to find that balance uh, how yeah. what do we put on the edge what do we have as a fog uh, interlayer and what do we have in the cloud yeah but uh, but for getting started with doing digital doing ai it's so much simpler to start with the cloud right. so that's why we are going that way i yeah. think yeah yeah no i fully understand yeah so as we're waiting for new questions to roll in, one of the things that you started with was that AI was a bit of a wild west in, uh, yeah. in, in Grundfos. So if, if I could ask each of you, what do you each of you think was the most helpful thing to bring some structure to the wild west? I mean, you know that in the wild west it was actually the uh, gold assayer, so the person that actually evaluated whether the gold that was found was actually high quality, was often the first one that started to bring structure to a really wild area. So I was curious what it was in, in your case, and I'm not sure if we start with you or yeah, with, start with, with we start with you. And then, uh, I, I guess this uh, about making code reproducible, like making like like you have Docker containers. Mm. You know that it's, I mean, often in my career I have been hit by by my own development that it worked perfectly on my computer 
and then I had to be sort of a consultant moving it to other people. Yeah. This Docker stuff is, is making life much easier that, you know, when I pack it in a Docker container and I give right. it to my colleague, it works. And, yeah. and I think I know. That, that, that's what I think maybe, maybe it's the most, for me, the, mo the most valuable. Yeah. Do you have a... Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. But I see that uh, the thing that I see actually that the most value that's coming is AI, uh, that is feedback loop that we can get by using the machine learning models. As Matt, as Matt has said, actually, we are developing the algorithm. And also, we, we have had like, a long journey actually just to develop an al al algorithms and just deploy it to the devices. Mm -hmm. But we usually we didn't have that actually feedback loop from the, from the algorithm yeah. when the algorithm is perf performing actually its, its job. I think using the AI and using actually this workflow of MLOps or whatever, I know even actually in future if we see that the reinforcement learning actually mm. pass in order to do the actually the intelligent decision decision yeah. taking stuff. Then this AI basically can help us just to improve over time. Right. So we know we know that it's a journey, but this this AI because it is data based data driven approach and we can actually improve and improve ourselves. And of course the technology this is coming, but if we have that mindset that now we are building something, but now we should do actually that continuous deep deployment all the time. Right. Then just we, we are in the right track. Yeah. And I don't like actually out some companies are coming, we do the AI, we do everything for you. Now actually we have a complete solution and then just you don't need just to do anything. And we have experience, as especially I've seen in this, in this project, the Wastewater Network Connect, actually it's about three or, three or four years we are working with this project. We see, we see complexity from real reality. Mm -hmm. We need just to do improvement, improvements. Yeah. But using actually with the, with, the, with the right actually approach, talk with the customers, understand what is the business request, yeah. involve other people, not only data scientists or data engineers, also the UI, UX developers, to be in that customer actually journey, journey track. And then just all together try to just to have that mind mindset, agile mindset, just to improve and improve it. And AI I think can, can actually mm. help you. Mm. Yeah. And maybe I should just mention, a, a f I think a future gold nugget is going to be a collaboration in, in the entire Grundfos because we're really depending on uh, priorities from business. We are depending on technology developments in other areas. Uh, embedded uh, developments and so on. So, so we are really also, uh, we need to move into the rest of the company somehow. Uh, the wave of AI needs to, to, uh, to spread so that, that people know what it is because yeah. it's really hard to explain. Um, and I think you also, m you mentioned that in your, <laughs> in, in your introdu introduction, Luis Pete. I think that that is a super important uh, point. And also one that Andrew Nings mentions as, as one of these five things that you need to have in place if you want right. to do a digital, uh, an AI transformation. Yeah. You need to educate everybody in AI, in yeah. data, uh, what will it take to be digital. Um, yeah. so, so I think that's going to be our future gold nugget, I hope. Um, yeah. That's going to really yeah. change that, uh, that structure. Yeah. So I have, I will let everyone in on a little secret. I've actually worked with Grunsfoss since 2012. Yeah. I've gotten to know the company as slightly mechanically engineering oriented. Yes. <laughs> I hope that that's a fair way <laughs> yeah, of saying it. I think that's a fair way. Yeah. I remember for a long time that even making pumps connected was a big of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do you reflect on the journey? How, how fast are you going? I mean, I know that you have new people yeah. coming in. I met your new CTO uh, recently. Yeah. So I think that some of the right mindset is being brought in. I think he has, uh, he has yeah. some good uh, points, at least from yeah. he's new. Uh, we need to see reality yeah. first, of course. But, uh, but I think he has a lot of good uh, ideas. And I think yeah. uh, we are not moving fast enough. Yeah. That's what I can say. We are moving uh, in a linear way. We are building on top of what we're doing. Yeah. We need to move exponentially. Yeah. And we're not doing that right now. Yeah. So uh, w we really need to speed up and, yeah. f and find better ways of uh, collaborating within yeah. the company. Now, I, oh yeah. uh, the TV just oh. turned off. If <laughs> you can get it back on again. It, uh, it had a warning that it said, because there was a question on the screen. And I'm, I'm pushing this a little bit, not because I want to put out uh, Grundfos, but because all the software center companies are struggling yeah, yeah. with this yeah. linear... It's the same things we are struggling uh, with. That yeah. we're struggling with. So I hope the screen comes back up again. Because there was one question I that I want to... Oh, you have it there? So maybe you read out yeah, a question. Uh, and then if you this model it. you develop is for your product, product development or offering service to customer. 
Yeah, on the screen as well. Okay, okay. Better. And as you said, this is a model which will be developed and modified with more accuracy over time. Uh, how you convince your customer to collect the data? I, I, so I think it's, it's a yeah, new it's model. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and basically, this is part of the product. We have a digital solution based for the Network Connect. But for sure, actually, we have a different versioning of the software. And mm -hmm. for each version, we have a specified for the customer that we provide this offering for you. And then just we have also some kind of contract with the customer that for in this offering you you can actually get actually this as output. But I think also we have actually some communication with our pilot customers that we see actually the new possibilities to do the new features, to add new features to our software. And for adding actually those new features, basically we are working with our pilot customers mm -hmm. to actually just to improve and improvement and build actually the new features. But for the existing feature where we see actually we have possibility for improvement. Again, then just we try to just to be in the in the agile mode. For example, yeah. the bugs we know that the bugs are coming sometimes, right? Mm. No. Yeah, and the, the yeah, but yeah, but, but I think we have, it's quite important. Just we, we 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 do it pretty fast, and now actually we are able to do it pretty fast. Basically, we are following the scrum way of working. Yeah. Uh, we have some kind of prioritization, and first priority all the time is the box yeah. that's coming from the customer. We need to solve it, and I think we are able to solve it in this and this and one day, and it goes to the production. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. I hope I have answered it. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, the person can reach out to you. So, uh, famous last words, if you would have to share one key takeaway from making AI successful at Grundfos, I'm going to ask each of you 10 seconds or less. Go for the other one. <laughs> so, Meta, <laughs> uh, you first. <laughs> Should I say something? Yeah. I think uh, communication is communication. key. Communication, yeah. Very good. For you, what was the, the key thing that made AI successful at Grundfos? Uh, I think you have a start to have actually the customer actually, to have customer Custom, customer, customer, customer feedback. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so your communication within the company, communication yeah. with the customer. Focus. <laughs> like, not, now we're doing this, now we're doing it. Now, no, now let's yeah. do that again. No, this one. I mean, yeah, yeah. Focus, and it, it takes time, yeah. and it's continuous. You cannot onboard and offboard all the time. Maybe. No. Great. Yeah. Good. So what I really enjoyed about this talk is that it's a real life case study of how to adopt AI in a company that traditionally prided itself on mechanical engineering yeah. uh, proudus because Grundfos is very good at that and has become yeah. very successful as a company yeah. because of it. So with that, I would like to thank uh, all of you, Mette, Reza and Rasmus for uh, taking the time to come out here all the way to Gothenburg yeah. from uh, <laughs> getting up at four <laughs> o'clock in the morning, yeah, if yeah. I remember correctly. <laughs> um, it's very much appreciated. Everyone who is in this call uh, or in this meeting, uh, feel free. I'm sure that Mette and the, her yeah, colleagues are happy to, uh, yeah, to work with her. We, we have really enjoyed working with Mette and colleagues because we have some peer your peers our PC students working with you actually already and uh, with that thank you once again for a great uh, presentation in this uh, community session and for everyone online